Welcome to another UWS-4 aerodynamic design video from the Ultralight Airplane Workshop. This is part 5 of a video series we're doing on designing the UWS-4 Ultralight Airplane. And in this video we are going to select the airfoil that we're going to use on the main wing of the UWS-4. Now if you haven't seen one of these videos before, we're using a book as our guide. And that book is called Simplified Aircraft Design for Home Builders and it's from Dan Raymer. It's a nice thin little book and as the title suggests, it's a really simplified mechanism for designing a light airplane. But in this case, we're applying it to an ultralight airplane, the UWS-4. The first version of this video ended up being 40 minutes long. That's just too long. So now I've cut it into two parts. This part is 5A. In 5A, we're going to talk about some of the criteria that we're going to use in selecting our airfoils. And then I'll introduce you to the airfoils that we're going to select from. We'll look at the shape of the airfoil and try to anticipate some of the characteristics of the airfoils just based on the shape. And then in part 5B, we'll go through actual analysis of these airfoils using the XFLR5 program. We'll select an airfoil and then based on that airfoil selection and its characteristics, we'll do some calculations on things like instance angle for the wing. Let's get into it. Let's do a little refresher on what we learned in the last video in part 4. Now, things we were figuring out were the configuration of the wing, or the parameters of the configuration of the main wing. So we figured out the surface area of the wing. That was 121 square feet. We figured out the span of that wing, so that's wingtip to wingtip. That was a little over 23 feet. We decided on a rectangular plan form, and basically the reason for that was to help us in construction of the wing. We only need one rib size for the whole wing. In other words, one rib jig. So that saves us a lot of time because with a tapered wing, we'd have to have a different jig for every rib in the wing and it takes a lot of time to make those jigs. So we make our life a little bit easier by making a rectangular wing. Another thing about the rectangular wing that I didn't mention last time is that we can usually get away without having to do washout on the wing. In other words, making the angle of the tack out of the tip a little bit more shallow than it is at the root. And the reason you want to do that, particularly on tapered wings, is if you don't, you can actually have the wing tip stall before the root stalls, which means you lose control of the airplane, at least roll control, while it's still partially flying, and that's not a good thing. You'd rather have the root stall first, so you can still have some control as you're entering the stall. With a rectangular wing, you almost always, by default, have the root stall before the tip, even if you don't put washout in there. Now, for the cord, we came up with 5.12 roughly feet. We decided not to have any sweep since we have a rectangular plan form and the mean aerodynamic cord is the same as the cords at the tip and the root of the wing. We decided on a five degree dihedral since it's a low wing. If it were a high wing we could go with just one or two degrees or possibly get away with nothing. And on the aileron we decided to make it 33% of the span and 25% of the cord. And we'll probably stick with that even if we change the span over here a little bit. If you remember on some of the earlier parts of the video, I said that if we have a little bit of weight to spare in the empty weight, in other words, if we're far enough under our 254 pound empty weight, I'll actually probably go ahead and increase the span of the wing a little bit, or at least increase the aspect ratio, which would end up increasing the span. So we get a little bit less induced drag while we're flying. So this may change, and if it does, I want the aileron to change, but we'll probably keep this same ratio here. Now, as I said, we're using Dan Raymer's book to work on all this, and we'll kind of use it as a rough guide for this video, although we might be just a little more freeform in this particular video compared to Dan's book. And if you want to buy Dan's book, there's going to be a link down in the description for this video that you can click on that will take it to the website for the channel, and you can find links to this book and other books there too. And by the way, those are Amazon associate links. So if you click on it, the channel will get a little cut of the proceeds. Let's get on to airfoil selection. Now Dan has his airfoil considerations on page 32 of his book. So if you want to kind of follow along with what I'm going to talk about here, go to page 32. Now for an ultralight airplane, our maximum level flight cruise speed is 55 knots. And that restriction is due to the FAA regulations part 103. Well, since we're going so slow, we really don't need a low drag airfoil. And by low drag, I mean a laminar flow. On a lot of laminar flow airfoils that are used for light planes, they're really intended for 
a much higher Reynolds number and they'll have a little drag bucket over on the left hand side, roughly in their cruise range. So we're not even gonna bother with a laminar flow airfoil, which means we're gonna have a turbulent flow airfoil. Now turbulent flow frequently means we're gonna have a fairly large radius nose. If we have a really sharp radius nose, that's usually an indication that they intended it to be a laminar, but the, we don't like that small radius nose because it can actually cause a really sharp fall off in our lift when we approach our stall. That's usually an undesirable characteristic on these low and slow airplanes. So we're generally going to be looking for an airfoil with a large radius nose. Having a thick airfoil usually helps a little bit with our lift also. So we're not going to shy away from thick airfoils. We will try to shy away from thin airfoils though. So something like a 12% airfoil is probably too thin for us. And by the way, when I say 12%, that's 12% of the cord. Now there's another advantage of having a thicker airfoil. By having a thicker airfoil, we can usually have a slightly lighter wing, at least up to a point. And the reason for that is the thicker the airfoil is, the higher our spar in that wing can be, assuming that we're building a wing with a spar, and in this case we intend to, then the spar caps can actually have less material in them, which can save some weight. So right now I'm thinking of selecting an 18% thick airfoil, so that's 18% of the cord, and the reason for that is that's what the Ultra Cruiser, there should be an R here, that's what the Ultra Cruiser uses, and that seems to work pretty well, so I'm going to use that as a starting point. So another change we could make later is if I'm disappointed with how much drag the wing is giving us, I could probably reduce the drag by going down to something like a 15% thick airfoil and reduce drag that way, but it'll probably make the wing just a little bit heavier and we'll probably lose just a little bit of lift. Another thing we need to consider on this airfoil is the coefficient of moment. And by the way, if you don't know what the coefficient of moment is, I'll put a link up here in the upper right hand corner That'll be a link to an aerial terminology video that I did quite a ways back that will describe coefficient of moment. But basically what it is, is it's the pitching moment of the wing, trying to pitch down or pitch up. And most wings always want to pitch down. In other words, the nose wants to go down as you're flying. Now, one of the consequences of having that pitch down nose moment is that we have to have a horizontal tail somewhere back of that main wing or a canard in front of the wing, whichever one you're going for. We're going for a a tail behind the main wing, you're going to have to have a horizontal tail to counter that pitching moment. So if you're trying to pitch nose down on the wing, you're actually going to have to push down on the tail to counter that. Now the more that coefficient of moment is, the bigger your tail is going to have to be to counter that nose down pitching moment. So you really want to have a lower pitching moment. By having a lower pitching moment, you can have a smaller horizontal tail, which will save weight. Another impact of having a large coefficient of moment is you're going to have more drag. And the reason for that is your horizontal tail is going to have to be pushing down harder. In other words, it's going to have to have more lift. And if you have more lift, you have more induced drag. So the more coefficient of moment you have to counter with that horizontal tail, the more drag you're going to have. So that's another reason to try to have a small coefficient of moment here on the main wing. So the other coefficient we need to think about for this airfoil is coefficient of lift. And in particular, the maximum coefficient lift, because that's where we're gonna stall at. The higher that coefficient lift can be, the smaller we can make our wing, and the more that we can save on weight. Now we've already decided on a coefficient lift of 2.0 for the wing, so we can meet the FAA part 103 requirements. So we're gonna to have to prioritize our CO max, but we can't sacrifice our coefficient of moment too much or coefficient of drag too much. We already mentioned that we're going to use a rectangular wing and I said we're not going to put any twist in the wing, washout. Now one way some people use to deal with washout, instead of doing washout, they actually put a different airfoil at the root than they do out at the wing tip. And so you can sometimes deal with that washout issue by doing that instead. But we're not going to do that, we're going to use the same airfoil across the entire wing. And again, that's so we only need one rib template, or possibly two. We might need one for left wing and one for the right wing. Now there are a massive number of airfoils that we could try. And we can design our own airfoil. But we've at least reduced the number of possible airfoils by saying no laminar airfoil. We're going to have a thick airfoil, right now 18% thick. We want a low coefficient of moment if we can, fairly high coefficient of lift, and coefficient of drag we're not 
quite as concerned about, but you'll end up seeing that I love concentrating on drag a little bit later. But the coefficient drag isn't quite as important. Although we don't want to have a huge coefficient drag because remember, one of the goals of this airplane is I want to fly fairly long distances to visit neighboring airports and then fly back home after visiting there with some of my friends. So I really want to have a fairly low drag airplane so I get more range. So I'm not going to let drag get carried away. Now here are some aerofoils that I have played with in the past. And so I decided to use those as a comparison. Now this first one is a Harry Riblet aerofoil that was used on the Ultra Cruiser. It was a GA30, and there should be a U here, 618. That's the model number for that aerofoil. And by the way, down in the description to the website, in the same area where you'll find books, like the one we're using now, the Dan Raymer book, You'll also find a little bit of information on Harry Riblet's book where I got this airfoil from. Now I like this airfoil because it's fairly successful and it was used on the Ultra Cruiser. Now another tried and true airfoil that's been around for ages and ages is the Clark Y airfoil. This is a much older traditional airfoil. It doesn't get used a whole lot nowadays and we'll do some comparisons to try to figure out why that is. But I want to include that in our comparison. Now here's another airfoil that one of my patron members was asking me about and asking for my opinion on. So let's go ahead and include this airfoil in our comparison list also. And then lastly, this is an airfoil that I designed. And so we'll include that in the comparison too. Now I designed this specifically for ultralights that I think is a fairly good compromise between coefficient lift, coefficient moment, and coefficient of drag. One of the operating points that I'm going to be comparing these airfoils on is at the anticipated cruise speed that I'm gonna have. Now I'm right now assuming that we're gonna have a cruise speed of about 45 knots. Now remember our maximum is 55, so I'm gonna pull back from that for our typical cruise speed, 45 knots. Now when we do our calculations, we always have to convert to feet per second. So it's around 76 feet per second. And we're gonna to wanna to have the dynamic pressure value calculated. And so here's the equation for that, where this row is air density, and so that turns out to be 6.856 for Q. So I want to find the coefficient of lift of the wing that we're going to have when we're cruising at 45 knots. Now here's the equation for that. So here's our gross weight, here's Q, and here's the surface area of our wing. So let's assume a gross weight of 517 pounds that we got from part two, and let's use our wing surface area that we just got from our last video, 121 square feet, that's part four video. So if we do that calculation, our coefficient of lift is 0.6231. That's a little bit high. If you look at Dan's book, he thinks the coefficient of lift should be under 0.5. So we're a little bit higher than what he recommends, but it's not too bad. I think that's fairly reasonable. But let's say we wanted to get down to his 0.5, what could we do? Let's come back up here. If we reduced our gross weight, that would reduce our coefficient of lift. If we increased our wing surface area, that would reduce our coefficient lift. So if we really did want to get down to that 0.5, we could reduce our gross weight a little bit. We might get lucky and have the airplane be lighter than what I estimated at 254 pounds. But if we went and increased the wing area, that would reduce our coefficient lift, but that would also decrease our stall speed, which isn't a bad thing, but it would increase our weight. So at the moment, I'm probably not gonna change our wing surface area yet. Now, if you'll remember back in part four, we also did a little bit of calculation where we used a gross weight of 472 pounds using an FAA standard pilot weight of 170 pounds and getting rid of our baggage. And we did that to come up with this 121 square feet of surface area. So if we use this 472 pounds up here for our gross weight, that changes our cruise speed to down to 0.56. So if we actually have a standard pilot and no baggage, we come pretty close to the top end of what Dan recommends for that coefficient lift. So if I lose a little bit of weight, this might work out pretty good. So like I said, I want to look at our airfoils roughly at this coefficient lift, a little bit higher and a little bit lower. But I know now that I want to look at how these airfoils are operating somewhere in this area and lower. To analyze our airfoils, I'm going to use a program called XFLR5. You can do a Google search on this XFLR5 and find it and download it. It's a free program to use. So feel free to go and do that. But in order to use XFLR5, I need to know at what Reynolds number the wing is going to be 
at when we're at cruise. Again, that 45 knots. And I need to know at stall, because we're going to do some comparisons on our airfoils at stall. Now, if you don't know what Reynolds number is, I'll put a link up here in the upper right hand corner. Again, that's to an aerial terminology video that I made covering Reynolds number. So that'll explain it a lot better than I can do here in this video. But just in case you're curious in order to calculate a Reynolds number, this is one of the equations for doing it. This L is a very important one, and this U is an important one. This L is the characteristic length of what are we trying to calculate the Reynolds number on. Now, in this case, that length is going to be the cord of our wing. Now, from part four, we calculated the cord of our wing is five point roughly two feet. So that's what we would plug into this location. Now, this U is the velocity, and again, that's feet per second. There's two velocities I'm interested in our cruise speed, 45 knots, and our stall speed, 24 knots. And in case you've forgotten, uh, due to the FAA Part 103 regulations, we have to stall at or below 24 knots. So 45 knots is 76 feet per second. And we need to know what the Mach number is because XFLR5 actually uses Mach number. And XFLR5 has an interesting limitation. We can only use two digits below the dot. So this is gonna be 0.7 rounded up and then at stall 24 knots that's roughly 40 and a half feet per second and that becomes 0 0.04 rounded up to two digits below the period and then this last value underneath is the kinesmatic viscosity and this is going to be sea level standard atmosphere and that turns out to be a value of 778 feet squared per second for the units so if we do all that calculation for a cruise, I'm gonna have a Reynolds number of roughly two and a half million. And at stall, my Reynolds number is 1.33 million. So that's what we're going to feed it into XFLR5. Well, we are now in the XFLR5 program. And what you're seeing here is a Clark Y airfoil, 18% thick. Now, as you can see, this is a turbulent airfoil, particularly because it's large rounded nose. There's absolutely nothing wrong with this airfoil. If you want to use a Clark Y, definitely go ahead and use it. It's a fantastic airfoil. Nothing wrong with it at all. Now, another one we're going to do is a Riblet GA30U815. So let me bring that up. Now, that's the blue airfoil here. Now, this airfoil has a little bit more camber than the Clark Y does. You can see that this blue line is a little bit above here and here. That means the camber line is higher. So you would expect that this airfoil, the riblet airfoil, should have a little more lift than the Clark Y does. Let's bring up another one. Let's bring up the Langley airfoil, which I actually didn't mention before. This is the GAW airfoil, 18% thick. Let's go ahead and bring it in here just for grins. Now you can see this one has far, far less camber down here. This is also a little bit more of a laminar flow, just a little bit. Let's go ahead and bring it up by itself. You can see how the thickness stays thick farther back than, let's bring up the Clark Y. It stays thick farther back than the Clark Y does. So we come down here to thickness percent at. On the Clark Y, its maximum thickness is at 28% of the cord. On this Langley, it's at 40% of the cord. So maximum thickness is much farther back. That actually helps to delay the separation of the boundary layer much further back on the airfoil and would generally give you a laminar flow further back. But what's also pretty interesting, this nose is actually fairly round. Now the good thing about that then is the stall shouldn't be very sharp. It should be a fairly rounded stall. And another feature you can see back here is open end. Now the Clark Y does not have that. You can see it comes to a point. The Langley is open ended. And another thing that you can see is down here at this tail, you can see the camber comes down fairly sharp on the bottom side also. So it's almost like having a little bit of a built-in flap. I thought that throwing this laminar airfoil in here would actually be an interesting comparison. The next one is the airfoil that I designed. Now it's this green one here. You can see that it bends down a little bit sharper than the Clark Y does back here at the aft end. It has a little bit of a cup on the bottom edge back here, just a little bit. That should actually help increase the coefficient lift just a little bit. And actually a slightly sharper nose than the Clark Y. So it'll be interesting to see the stall comparison between these two. And then the last one that we have here is the Wartman. Let's bring that one up. So here's the Wartman and look at this. It's got a huge cusp back here on the trailing edge. 
that should give us a fairly high coefficient lift on this airfoil. It has a fairly rounded nose. Let me actually show you something that bothered me a little bit about this one. It's not the airfoil's fault, it's the points that I have. You can see, hopefully, that there's some kind of flat areas on this airfoil. That's a problem with the points that I was given. So I'm not quite certain that I know what to do with that, but I'm just going to leave it like it is. Now, I've also put flaps on these. Let's go back to my airfoil. And you can see that I've added flaps on each one of these airfoils. The flap comes to 25% of the cord, and I hinged it down here at the bottom edge. And they're all deflected 40 degrees. Since we want to know what the behavior of the wing is when we're landing with high coefficient lift and the flaps deployed, we want to see how high that coefficient lift is going to be. So we're going to compare that on these airfoils. Now the Reynolds number for this airfoil is going to be the lower one, the one at 24 knots. For the one without the flap, we'll be using the Reynolds number at 45 knots for those. Before we finish this video, I want to give a shout out to my patrons that are early bird subscribers, KP and Ryan. Thanks a lot for supporting the channel, guys. The early bird subscribers get to see our videos at least five days early, sometimes a little more because I forget to make them public. Now, what are we going to do in the next video, part 5B? Well, we have a little bit of a spoiler right here. What we're going to do is make a list of the airfoils to analyze. And I actually chose this list partly based on what I knew would probably be a good airfoil, and then also a couple other airfoils to throw in there to show what probably isn't a good airfoil for an ultralight airplane. We're going to analyze these airfoils then using the XFLR5 program. When we do that analysis, we're basically going to get coefficient drag, coefficient lift, and coefficient of moment. Then based on that analysis and what we just talked about on the characteristics that we want in an airfoil, we're going to select an airfoil. And then once we have that selection, We'll use the characteristics of that particular airfoil to go back then and calculate some wing characteristics when that wing is using the airfoil we selected. Well, that's it for now, guys. Thanks for watching. Until next time.